Hello students of history. So today we are going to be looking at the Spanish conquest of the New World. We're going to meet the great uh, conquistadors. They have now been transformed from exploradors to conquistadors. They are going to begin conquering the New World. And we're going to examine the Spanish conquest of the New World, not in the sense of uh, one where the Spaniards are the superiors and they are overwhelming a small native population, but we're going to do this in line with uh, Matthew Restall, the great historian, the great modern historian's uh, analysis of the New World and the seven myths of the, of the Spanish conquest that have kind of been perpetuated in, in our own Western history. And through this, we're going to meet these great conquistadors, such as Hernan Cortes, but we're going to see them in context uh, with the natives of the New World and the roles, uh, the key roles that these various alliances played against the empires of the Aztecs and, and the Maya, as well as the, uh, the Incas. And then we are going to begin looking after the, the Spanish, the initial phase of the Spanish conquest uh, occurred. Then we're going to begin examining piracy and kind of the, what was piracy? Why do we have this, this great nostalgia for these pirates, these, these Blackbeards and Anne Bonnies and uh, Black Sam Bellamy's of the world? And why do we think of these people as almost heroic, you know, a, a golden age, we call it, of piracy in, in the Caribbean following uh, the, the beginnings of the Spanish Empire in the New World? And ultimately, what effect does this have upon uh, U.S. history eventually? Well, we're going to ask these questions, but we're also going to, to uh, really dive in and look at kind of what is going on in the Spanish New World um, and what allows a time of, of conquest to be transformed eventually uh, of, of enormous riches by the, the Spanish Empire will gain through the 17th century. And then it will basically all dissipate. It will all be lost. And the great winners of the, uh, the maritime game and, and, and the great uh, winners in the wars of empire are the English and the Dutch not the Spanish, and the Spanish made fortunes in the New World. And we're going to ask ourselves, why was that? So I look forward uh, to, uh, to going through this with you. I'll see you in the next, uh, next portion of this lecture. Again, so in this portion of our lecture, we are going to just take a minute. I'd like to review from last time the civilizations that are about to be subjugated to the Spanish Empire. And that is the Inca, the Maya, and the Aztec civilizations. And these are massive civilizations in the New World. And they had vast empires, and they were very much imperial powers, that they were imposing their will uh, upon subjugated peoples. And the Spaniards are going to show up and they are going to turn the tables on these great powers and they are going to make use of other native peoples who hated the uh, the aztecs and and the inca as just as much as uh, as the inca and the aztec hated the spanish so it is one of alliance that we will see but there are are um, much uh, many complexities that go into this period of conquest and it starts out that there is approximately 50 million people, a native population, uh, in the world. They do not have alphabetic writing. They do not have, uh, they, they are not a civilization that has steel. They are not a civilization that has developed gunpowder. And uh, they are not a civilization that is immune to many of the really terrible diseases such as smallpox and syphilis. Uh, that are going to be given to these people that they, they are really going to uh, be decimated by eventually. Not immediately, uh, but over time, um, there is a massive uh, a decimation of native populations through disease, exploitation, uh, uh, and, and eventually, of course, kind of a, a ethnographic or, 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 a, or a cult acculturation by the Spanish as they, they uh, wipe out the, the eventually, not immediately, but eventually wipe out the languages and cultures of these people uh, to a great degree as they are forced to assimilate into uh, a Spanish, Spanish ethos and, and Spanish religion and, and uh, uh, Spanish language. 
So let us begin uh, first just by, we've hinted at this at the, the Columbian Exchange here, that uh, when Christopher Columbus discovers the island of Hispaniola in the, in the Caribbean, that there begins an exchange from the New World to the Old. So you can hardly imagine um, Italy without tomato sauce. Uh, you can, can hardly imagine um, Ireland without potatoes. Yet, none of these things happened until the Columbian Exchange because tomatoes, potatoes, um, peppers are all going to be New World crops. And then we see uh, a movement of, of goods coming from the, uh, the Old World to the New World as well. So there is a massive exchange here of, of agricultural goods as well as disease. And this is primarily an import from Europe, and uh, this is one of the main reasons uh, why uh, the Western Europeans were able to so successfully uh, conquer uh, the the eventually not to, the, now this is not something that just uh, you know is a massive plague that destroys the entire native population overnight, um, but this is a slow uh, slow death of these native populations. Uh, but this is a, definitely a major reason why. Um, Europeans were able to overwhelm native populations. And of course, then there's also an exchange of ideas. Um, there's an exchange of, of religious ideas, largely bringing Christianity into the New World, but also that these people were not Christians. So there it begins a period of questioning. So uh, the, the notion that, that natives had never heard of God or Jesus uh, or the Holy Spirit. Um, this brings the great question of why to the four in Europe. And, and therefore, um, they began to ask, well, maybe, maybe we need to rethink how we, we have uh, believed in our religion as being revealed to all people. Uh, maybe, maybe there's something else here. Maybe, uh, maybe Christianity has not been revealed to everyone. So it brings in this kind of a uh, enlightenment sense of, of questioning that this is a really traumatic thing to, uh, to European theology and religion. So let us move now into the period of the Spanish conquest. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, this is a time that we're going to see a transformation from exploradors to conquistadors. That no longer are we going to be uh, taking voyages around the world with Ferdinand Magellan or discovering islands in the Caribbean uh, with Christopher Columbus. But this is the point where groups of Spaniards who are excited um, and, and adventurous and seeking fortunes and fame show up in the New World uh, and they begin to carve out settlements that they believe are now their lands uh, by, by right. As uh, the Pope and the King of Spain has, uh, has given them right in the Treaty of Tordesillas, uh, the Pope uh, the, who speaks for Christ himself the Vicar of Christ has, has uh, given all the lands to Spain, and therefore they have a right to come and take these things, of course, from the, uh, the Native Americans, and they're quite eager to do so. Uh, and they're, they're eager to do so and, and make fortunes from, from precious metals and, uh, and the settlement of, of uh, various towns and lands. So Hernan Cortez is the... Not necessarily the first, but he is the most uh, successful of all the conquistadors that will come over. And Hernan Cortes may actually have been the luckiest man uh, ever in the history of the world because he falls into a situation that is politically uh, perfect for him. He finds a guide that speaks numerous languages that hates the Aztecs. And he also uh, is just very fortunate in battle. He, he's able to use um, alliances to help him. Uh, he, he does have a certain amount of, of political guile about him, but ultimately he is able to use his, uh, his technological advantages uh, to, to uh, help him. And this... All of these factors allow for him to basically overthrow the, the Aztecs in their, their chief city of, of Tenochtitlan, which was a, a huge, massive city uh, in, uh, in, in uh, southern, uh, southern Mexico, or what we will now refer to as, as uh, New Spain. 
So first, I just want to I want to begin thinking about before we get into kind of the conquest of Cortez, which I'll show you his his route here in, in the next slide. Um, but the historian Matthew Restall has argued strongly, and I think quite convincingly, that there are myths of the Spanish conquest, that when we think of the Spanish conquest, we think of Hernan Cortez showing up uh, on the island of Hispaniola, uh, gathering a, a very small contingent of, of Spanish troops, and then basically marching to Tenochtitlan and overthrowing the, the Aztec emperor Montezuma and destroying the armies with his vast... Uh, vast knowledge and superior technology and uh, the the natives believing him to be a god and and uh, and laying down and giving up their own culture and just utterly accepting and completely accepting um, his rule over them so Restal uh, wants to dispel this this sort of myth that has been perpetuated in, in Western history in the history of the United States to some degree um, and instead he says I'm going to take these seven myths, these big myths, uh, and I'm going to show you that they they weren't, they were not uh, happening in the same way that we have maybe believed or been led to believe uh, in more general histories for some time. So the first myth of the Spanish conquest is that of of exceptional men, that Hernan Cortez, uh, De Soto, uh, uh, Pizarro, Pedro de Alvarado, that these men were of great and wise knowledge or you know that they had exceptional knowledge that they were able to uh, overwhelm their enemy because they were so much smarter um, than their enemy they had so much greater technology um, that they, they were just better people than their native enemies just simply was not true to to uh, speak to this Cortez was extremely lucky that he uh, he finds a woman who had been enslaved by the Aztecs, whose name was Melitzen, and she was of very high social status uh, among a, a rival uh, tribal group to the the Aztecs, the Thalaxicans, and she was able to speak numerous languages. She she uh, she hated the Aztecs, and she was able to help him. And he was uh, he he realized this, and he protected her enormously. Technology was also something that was not vastly overwhelming. After a short time, yes, uh, the uh, the natives were afraid of the weapons that the Spaniards had. The steel was superior to their own uh, obsidian weapons, but they were only there in very small numbers, and their uh, matchlock. Muskets and cannon were almost of no use in a tropical uh, setting because they could not use the gunpowder because it became wet. Um, so in many cases, they were, could, not, could not fight in the same way they could in Europe, but they were able oftentimes to be used as shock troops because the great native armies um, were able to, that, uh, that Cortez, through Melitzen's uh, uh, great negotiating uh, powers, were able to unite uh, the enemies of the Aztecs against them, so you would see thousands of, of native armies fighting uh, the Aztec armies, and uh, then the conquistadors would be used as shock troops because they had horses. There was no mounted warriors in, in the ancient world, and their steel and, and heavy armor did, uh, did give them somewhat of a technological advantage. Um, but the kind of this notion that uh, these, these people were just exceptional warriors and a very small uh, group of, of uh, Spaniards was able to conquer all of the natives is, is, uh, was just uh, really questioned here it, with Restal. The notion, second myth of the Spanish conquest is the notion that there was a Spanish army, that the Spaniards never really thought of themselves as the Spanish. This is something that's imposed later by nationalism. Uh, rather, they thought of themselves as being Aragonese or, or uh, Cordovan. You know, that they did not think of themselves as simply being a, you know, one people against a native population. Rather, they had as many uh, rivalries uh, be, uh, between themselves as they did amongst the, the natives, because these are people who came from regions of Spain who had long uh, been at odds with each other. So there was not a great unity among the Spaniards that is often taught to us. 
Um, there's kind of this notion also that we have the, uh, you know, the great white uh, conquistador here, that Cortez um, and his his men, as I have kind of spoke to this already with the exceptional men, um, that they were able in very small numbers, that 300 or f to 500 Spaniards were able to overwhelm tens of thousands of great Aztec warriors. And Restall shows that this just isn't the case, that it was the native confederations that rose up against uh, the Aztecs that were allowed eventually Cortez to take uh, Tenochtitlan, uh, and that his, simply his presence and, and the, the Spanish uh, the, the, their negotiation and their willingness to attack the Aztecs and to, to unite the other tribes against uh, this enemy that had oppressed them, that had maybe pr uh, practiced a human sacrifice uh, against these people, right? They, they hated the Aztecs, and they were very willing uh, to fight against them. And they do mo the vast majority of the fighting, if we read uh, the actual accounts. And as I say, the Spanish were only shock troops. Um, the fourth myth, that there was sort of this complete and total conquest of uh, the, the Americas in a very short time and that natives just uh, gave up their ethnicity, they gave up uh, their political autonomy, uh, just simply not the case, Restall shows us. Uh, he shows that there were regions uh, in, in uh, the Yucatan and, and Central America that, uh, that held out with their own political autonomy um, as late as 1700. Uh, there's sort of also this notion, uh, the myth of, of communication, that the natives were immediately learned Spanish and the Spanish could communicate in, in the native languages. Uh, it's just simply not the case. And that eventually, uh, or, you know, that this, this communication or this, this, uh, this flawless communication led to a, uh, just simply a, a acculturation of the New World to the Spanish. This was not the case. Sixth myth, that of native subjugation. And this is one that the Spanish were able, through their superiority, to keep the native populations um, uh, down under their rule and authority, and simply uh, the natives saw themselves as vassals to the uh, Spanish overlord. Now, research has confirmed that actually natives did, did not think this way, that after the Aztecs were overthrown, um, that they believed themselves to be in alliance and themselves to be uh, in, in partnership with the Spanish instead of being their, uh, their subjects. Um, rather that it was a confederation and, and not a, uh, uh, an absolute empire as has often been thought of and that there's much differentiation um, between native groups that we sort of see all uh, Native Americans as one group or at least it, it are sometimes portrayed this way but there is a much difference uh, between these peoples as there is among European nations and, and regions uh, so, therefore, uh, to see this as sort of just a flat, uh, overwhelming conquest is, is incorrect. And lastly, that of Spanish superiority, that uh, simply the knowledge, the technology, everything about the, the Spaniards was superior to that of the, the native populations. And Restall shows us that this just simply was not the case, that uh, the Spanish did have some certain advantages, uh, but certainly it was not an overwhelming superiority. After all, these people were mortals, uh, just like uh, the native populations that they uh, subjugated eventually. Now let us return to uh, the conquest here of Hernan Cortes. And in this discussion of the, the myths of the Spanish conquest here, I mentioned that there was lots of native tribal regions. So here you can see the, um, the empire of the Aztecs. And here you can see kind of the native regions um, and these tribal groups, and, and there's many of them. And the Aztecs were able to um, subjugate these, these kingdoms under force. And, and so therefore, uh, the, especially their, their rival empire, the, the Talaxicans, uh, they 
did not in any way wish to be under Aztec rule. It was only through force. And, and the Aztecs had their great city of Tenochtitlan, uh, present-day Me Mexico City, uh, or in the region of present-day Mexico City. Um, and it was a massive, massive urban area. Maybe as many as 100,000 people leave, lived in uh, Tenochtitlan. Uh, and they were able to, to, from this capital, impose their political will over these tribal regions. So they were very eager to resist uh, the Aztecs who demanded enormous amounts of taxes and, as I said, from time to time, even human sacrifice uh, if you were a particular troublesome province uh, of the Aztec Empire, that they would uh, bring back some of your people to sacrifice in their, their temples. Uh, so they were not beloved by those who they ruled over. And Cortez was able to make his way up the coast uh, with, his, uh, with his great negotiator, Melitzen, uh, who was, of course, uh, of, of high status, and she was able to use her status to communicate, and she knew people, she knew where to take Cortez, she guided him, uh, she said, this is who you need to talk to, this is, uh, this is who you need to manipulate against people. So her, Cortez had an, a, an enormous advantage uh, against, uh, uh, against his enemies by having this woman with him, who knew everything. She knew everyone, and she knew, uh, she knew how to play people against other people. She was skilled at the game of high politics in this region, uh, and it is, is through her that, and her influence that he was able to, to do this. And, and by uh, uniting these native tribes uh, with her influence, they were able to rise up against the Aztecs and using the, the, uh, the conquistadors, as, as shock troops in battles that they were able to uh, defeat the Aztec armies and eventually take Tenochtitlan. In uh, a somewhat similar fashion, although they did not have a Militzen uh, with them, uh, Francisco Pizarro, one of the lieutenants of Hernan Cortes, is after the conquest of Tenochtitlan and the Aztec Empire, is able to move as they hack their way through the jungle and they, they get to Panama and they're going to uh, move down the coast of, of Peru, and they will eventually take the city of, uh, of uh, Cusco uh, nearly 10 years later. So it's a 10-year a conquest here, keeping in mind that I'm going to sum up for you in, uh, in exactly one minute. But uh, with the conquest of the Aztec Empire, that of the Mayas, as well as uh, the conquest of Francisco Pizarro and his men, uh, who also used, uh, used uh, native tribes against uh, the ruling Incas, that they were able to take their fabled city of, of Cusco, uh, and, and uh, after getting uh, the massive gold reserves there, were able to, to enrich themselves enormously. So Pizarro, Cortez, both very lucky. Uh, both uh, were able to use uh, native populations, manipulate them against uh, each other, uh, and very much these native populations saw themselves as partners in this conquest because they had been sub, uh, subjugated um, by the ruling elites uh, um, in their own time. So after the conquest of Peru, and we really began to see starting in the 15th, 30, late 1530s, 1540s, um, the Spanish crown begins to take interest in the New World because of the vast amounts of wealth that were acquired there, that there was m enormous uh, gold uh, reserves, there was enormous silver reserves, uh, there were jewels, and this all meant that you could get quite rich. So uh, the Spanish crown wants to assimilate these territories and, and to put royal agents in charge of these instead of just having sort of a, a gang of, uh, or a band of adventurers um, that are going to uh, control things, like such as Cortez, right? He's not, I mean, he's, he's uh, licensed uh, by the king to come over, um, but he basically is just his own man. He's in charge of his own troops, um, and, 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 and these are private individuals who are sort of making these adventures into the new world, trying to find fame and fortune. And we see some of the later explorers, really other than Cortez and Pizarro, they are not very successful in gaining uh, wealth and fame. We think of Ponce de Leon, who's famous for his uh, journeys into Florida, where he sought the Fountain of Youth as well as, um, as, well as, as riches. And it's now kind of thought that once the natives figured out what these uh, what these Europeans wanted that they wanted gold and they wanted all these fantastical things and this uh, that they would lead them they would say oh yes that's just over there 
Uh, if you just keep going, it's about 100 miles the other direction. Just get out of our territory, and yes, that's where the fountain of youth is. Yes, that's where it is. You can drink from it. Um, so he was, searched in vain, did Ponce de Leon, for something to make him rich and young and keep him young, uh, but uh, alas, he never found it. Uh, we think of Francisco Coronado, who searched for the fabled seven cities of gold of El Dorado. And he made his way all the way to present-day Kansas. And he came up all the way from Mexico and searched across the southeastern deserts of the present-day United States, um, and, but never found El Dorado. He's always said, just a little farther. And the natives kept saying, just a little farther. If you just go a little bit farther, it's out, out there. Oh, yes, the seven cities of gold, we've heard of them. They're just a bit north of here. And, uh, but he, alas, never found them. And then we have uh, Hernando de Soto who explored much of the southeastern portion of the United States. He was probably the first European to encounter the, the Cherokee tribes where he was uh, promptly enslaved. And he and, uh, and uh, another man who was in his company, uh, they basically lead the Indians to believe that he that they are were, were famous medicine men that they could uh, they could heal people and actually they do a fairly good job of that and so they are are taken uh, with the um, with the Cherokee and they are they are allowed to explore and they were able to to map out much of the um, of the southeastern portion of the United States because of their success. And eventually DeSoto uh, is going to uh, to die at making his way all the way through the Ozarks and coming to the Mississippi River. And there he is buried in the river. So now let us look at the Spanish Empire here. This is a map of the year 1600. And... Largely speaking, that the Spanish Empire of the New World was divided into two regions, and that is the Viceroyalty of New Spain, which um, is, is about from the Isthmus of Panama uh, all the way north, extending into uh, all the way into to North America, the, the present day United States, uh, and then you have the voice, Viceroyalty of Peru which would um, be composed of everything down the Pacific coast uh, nearly to, to present day, uh, Argentina. And within that includes all of the Caribbean islands uh, and, and Florida. So a vast, vast area here. And there was an attempt by the Spanish crown, of course, to create viceroys in the New World because communications take months and months to get back and forth between Spain. So you really have to have an agent uh, that can dispatch the will of the crown, and that was the viceroy, uh, you know, the, the greatest governor of the land. But under the viceroyalties um, were these traditional kingdoms, uh, and many of these regions might even have been uh, uh, natives who were ruling under the authority of, of the viceroy, uh, or it might have been an appointed governor from the crown of this particular province of here or there. And notice that all of the choicest and, and best uh, best placed islands, the most strategic positions here are held of the Spanish crown, and that only just a very few islands um, will eventually, uh, the, the, the last pickings of, of, um, of, the, of the lot um, is going to go to England and France and people who get into the, the, uh, the game very late, very late indeed, and uh, they will, will not have the, the best placed islands uh, nor the richest islands. So what did Spain gain from its colonization of the New World? And here you can see uh, a Spanish piece of eight, which was the standard coin, a silver coin that was, uh, was minted from the, uh, from the New World. And why did they call it a piece of eight? Well, if you, in, in uh, pre-modern times, coin were actually, of course, made of the precious metal that they were part of. So how do you make change? Well, you don't have dimes and pennies and all these kinds of things, though they do have coins of differing values, but you would just simply cut the coin into pieces. So I'll give you three pieces of eight or, uh, you know, whatever for, uh, for a particular good that if it was not worth an entire silver coin um, rather than... Uh, 
then you would just simply you cut it and you you uh, and this is how change was made in the ancient world so that's a spanish piece of eight but here i have you um, a chart of the amount of gold the amount of, of wealth that was flowing out of the uh, the colonies of the new world and and of course remembering that this wealth was not um you know let's say uh, decently come by of course the native populations were subjugated around uh, the mines and the rich areas and oftentimes that they were forced into slave labor to work in these mines that uh that they were just uh, you know human uh, uh meat grinders if you will um, but they just would uh, send these natives in they would work them to death and then they would send more natives in and keep working them to death um, until until they were eventually uh, with the import of um, with African slaves but you can see here the vast wealth that came from the new world and each of these regions is kind of broken down into uh, to, uh, pesos. And this is just a staggering amount of wealth that comes into the old world from the new world. Because this is not something that was mined out of Peru um, and it was then shipped, or that it stayed in, in the old world, or the new world, but it is shipped then, of course, to the new world in vast uh, Spanish treasure fleets. And when this bullion came into the old world, it of course creates inflation that uh, one, uh, one historian estimates that uh, in one decade that the Spanish brought more than five times the amount of gold and silver that was at that, at that time available in Europe just to Spain. So this of course creates enormous amounts of inflation when you bring vast amounts of new money into a region everything is going to go up in price enormously uh so this this is problematic and then then of course the flow of this money is that the spanish wanted the luxury goods of of uh, of china so all of this precious metal from the new world goes to spain or portugal uh, and then from there it goes on uh, to china through the hands of various merchants so who who eventually profits out of all of this? Uh, well, of course, it's the Chinese. And here you can see the fabled uh, Spanish treasure route that Spanish mines, it largely in Peru, where the great gold and silver mines are, and, and on up here in, in present-day Venezuela. Um, you can see how this trade would uh, they would the coins would be minted uh, in Peru and they would move up the the coast to, to Panama or even a little bit farther to to the Acapulco region uh, and from there from Veracruz uh, they would uh, they would go across uh, the isthmus here or excuse me through the straits uh, uh, of Florida and then on to Spain or take the more dangerous route from Panama and uh, try to go through the the pirate islands uh, down here in the south of the Caribbean. Um, much safer route to come out of Veracruz, M many uh, less uh, pirates this way, but uh, nevertheless there were pirates eventually going to be everywhere. But you can see here, uh, you know, how this, this, uh, this trade route has to work because of the prevailing uh, currents and winds that come into the, uh, the Caribbean. And this is a sailing ship world, always keep, keep in mind, because or you can only do so much you can only move with the certain winds and currents and it's very difficult uh, to do this and it's based upon a seasonal pattern which would allow for pirates privateers and, and uh, anyone who wanted to try to steal from the spanish uh this these uh, vast amounts of of precious cargo that would allow them to know kind of when that the spanish were planning uh, to to take their great treasure fleets from veracruz or from panama So, speaking of this, this enters us into a time that uh, is often referred to as the golden age of piracy. And, and you can see here that there were pirates um, everywhere uh, in the world, and pirates would frequently move from one place to another that uh, when they would get into trouble in a particular region of the world that they might sail somewhere else uh, and try their luck uh, you know in in uh, off the coast of africa because remember of course shipping is going around the horn of africa here between uh between china india uh the uh, the east indies 
and then back to Europe. Um, so you would see a movement, you could see a movement of pirates from place to place. Um, but this golden age of piracy, as we uh, are referring to it here, um, is one that, that really occurs around the time of the uh, of 1600 to 1730, let us say. Um, that this is a time of lawlessness in the Caribbean. That largely English, uh, English men come over and they begin to set up bases on the, the uninhabited uh, Caribbean islands or come into small ports or, or places like this in, uh, in, in English colonies. And they, um, they begin to start pillaging vessels. And they sometimes do this legally. They sometimes do this as pirates. It's uh, kind of unclear sometimes what the difference between a pirate is and what a pirate isn't. But it is these pirates of the Caribbean, these people that we call buccaneers, um, that were that uh, that are in popular memory thought of as these great uh, and fabled uh, pirates like Blackbeard, Black Sam, Bellamy, uh, Anne Bonny, uh, just these larger than life personalities that come alive as uh, buccaneers in the uh, in this age of or in this golden age of so this was the golden age of piracy as i say and this time period is recounted to us in this this great the kind of the father of all pirate histories is general history of pirates by captain charles johnson this was published in 1724, and much of what we think of and sort of this, this bucolic time of these exciting figures, these, um, these people that we see played by Johnny Depp on screen are coming right out of this, this grand history of pirates. And this is a, is a wonderful read if you ever have the time to look at it, but uh, this is where all uh, exploration of pirates begins is from this, this, uh, this publication. And here, if we take a look at this map, we can see many of the, the great pirate layers of, of, uh, of the golden age here. And we can see it all begins in the island of, of Providence and uh, from the Isles of, or the island of Jamaica, we have Port Royal, um, the British colony, and more on that in a minute. But really, Nassau here is, um, is the epic, most epic pirate uh, layer here. And uh, we will we'll get more on that later. But uh, remember here, we, we see how uh, the currents of the Caribbean Sea work is that it takes you right up here around Cuba and you have to come back you have to uh, this is how you sail out here you can follow the the uh, the Spanish who are going to be coming out of Havana they'll come out of, of Panama or and Portobello and Veracruz and they're all going to land in Havana and they are going to at that point have to kind of make decisions on on how to to get out of the Caribbean and Nassau, um, as well as uh, as Port Royal, are very well suited for pillaging uh, Spanish uh, shipments here. Um, but before we discuss this any further, we need to talk about the nature of piracy and raiding, and how does this all originate? Is this golden age of, of buccaneers, and why do we call them buccaneers and versus pirates, and, and how does this all work? So the English crown. And uh, the Dutch, the French get into the game later, uh, but they basically have the idea that they need a navy. And this all originates back in the year of our Lord, 1588, when Philip of Spain gathers together all his vast navy, they build a massive armada, and they are going to attempt to invade England. And this all originates from religious differences. The Catholic powers of Spain... And the crown of Spain are deeply concerned with the heresy, the continued uh, harassing of their trade by the English, who were a fly on the, the, uh, on the proverbial neck of the elephant. And England, of course, being much smaller 
than than the the holdings of the Spanish crown. They get together, as I say, this armada, and they begin to sail for England and for invasion. A vast fleet of more than a hundred galleons, the largest fleet that had ever sailed from from Spain. And it is only through cunning and luck that the English were able to thwart the invasion of their homeland. At this time in, in 1588, they actually used, uh, the, as the Spanish fleet puts into port, uh, some uh, clever sailors led by Sir Walter Raleigh, who we will come to know and love very soon. Um, they are uh, they put fire ships out, and it uh, scatters the Spanish fleet. It catches much of it on fire, and eventually uh, the, the entire armada, or what was left of the armada that didn't burn up at, in the harbor uh, off France, um, that they were able to... Uh, they had to sail all the way around the north of Scotland, and they meet a vast storm. And anyway, of the only, all the ships, only two uh, are able to return to harbor in Spain uh, and saving the English from Spanish invasion. But uh, in this time, the English come to realize that they were in dire need of a professional navy. They had neither the money nor the political will in order to create a large professional navy that could rival the Spanish. So therefore their answer was to turn to greed and to turn to private citizens. And they gave private citizens uh, the the right to pillage Spanish shipping. So uh, various captains would uh, would get a letter of marque which is just a, as I say a, a letter from the crown that allowed them to go out and to attack Spanish vessels or, or any vessel um, that was uh, or th that England was in a, a state of war with, so they could uh, they had a legal right, of course, to to uh, from at least in England <laughs> they were pirates to the Spanish, but they were privateers um, to the the crown of England, and and for the uh, for this letter of mark. The crown will get one tenth share of all the cap, all that is captured uh, by these privateers, and this was a, a inexpensive way for England, uh, for for the uh, kings and queens of England to have a navy that would uh, chip away at the Spanish advantage and uh, net a little bit of gain for England and for the crown, but also uh, allow them to have a large merchant uh, quasi quasi naval force that would uh, would. Uh, create some form of a blockade at very little expense to the crown. So these are privateers. Now, there's very subtle difference between a privateer and a pirate. Because, of course, when England is not at war, then you lose your ability to raid Spanish shipping. And sometimes when you are sailing around in the southern Atlantic and the Pacific and pillaging Spanish shipping, you don't get the memo that certain uh, peace treaties have been struck in Europe for quite some time. And therefore, you might have taken Spanish ships in a time of peace, and this gets you into an enormous amount of trouble, or you might not care. Um, and Anyway, all of this can lead to, to legal problems for those who hold letters of mark. And one of these people uh, uh, was uh, most famous was uh, Captain Kidd, who actually ends up uh, being hanged, uh, who was a, a famous privateer uh, for England. And he had, uh, had done much to, to further the cause of the English crown, but uh, he, he found himself run afoul of the law for uh, illegal, uh, uh, you know, illegal... Um, privateering, which would, we might refer to as piracy, and he's eventually hanged for this. Um, it's a sad story, and one we don't have an entire time to, to tell here, but um, there are these, uh, England was famous for sending these, these privateers into the Caribbean, and, and uh, most of them, though, turn out to, to be rather lucky. People like Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, Sir Francis Drake, and you can, if you were in London these, uh, currently, you can go and see his ship, the Golden Hind. Uh, and these people were adventurers, and they were uh, soldiers of fortune, and they were able to uh, sail, uh, sail the, uh, the Caribbean Sea, and, uh, and take on much, much uh, wealth from their commissions as privateers. And they would go to British colonies where they would use as bases uh, to raid Spanish shipping. 
and even uh, uh, Sir Henry Morgan, if you've ever drank uh, Captain Morgan rum or, or heard of this, is uh, named after him. Uh, but he was he was even able to lead an expedition across the Isthmus of Panama um, and raid uh, the very the very Spanish uh, 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 cities and forts there, and he he sacks Panama City, and and uh, and takes a, a fortune with him, and it turns out well for uh, Henry Morgan as he gets a knighthood uh, out of this deal for his services to the crown. Now these private uh, or these pirate havens that are all over the Caribbean, uh, but there's some really big and important ones. You have the New Providence, which is where all piracy begins really in the Caribbean, at least in the golden age of piracy. You have Nassau, you have Tortuga, uh, and various other places, but um, these are, are places that are lawless, um, that, that groups of privateers, sailors who have uh, abandoned their ships, now they would uh, we would come together. Escaped slaves would be there, and sort of the, there's this notion that everyone was equal, and you could just uh, you could go out and pursue your fortune. You could pursue under your your own time and and under your own will that you were not under the whip of of the merchant marine and and uh, and royal captains if you had to serve in the royal navy. Um, but rather, you were treated fairly and with respect. And there's a lot of a uh, lot of work that has been done about piracy and uh, and these sort of pirate republics in in the Caribbean at this time in the golden age of piracy. But Nassau ends up being one of the great pirate uh, havens uh, for this. That they that there was disagreement amongst uh, the privateers at the end of one of the many wars between uh, England and Spain, and. Uh, Finally, Benjamin Hornigold, one of the famous uh, pirate commodores, says, I am leaving and I'm going to Nassau. And he is a, it's basically an abandoned British colony there where there's a very three or four houses. Uh, and they set up shop there and this becomes the sort of the hive and the, the origin of all of, uh, of the, the great pirates of the time. And Hornigold will set out as a privateer. And he was, uh, you know, he was a legitimate privateer. He would never attack English shipping. He just didn't want to stop attacking Spanish shipping. Uh, he, was, he would never claim to be a pirate, but he was always in service of the crown uh, attacking the Spanish. And eventually they will, uh, will turn on uh, some French vessels and this, these kinds of things. But uh, uh, Hornigold is never allows his crews in order uh, er, to, to attack English shipping and, and English vessels. Now, others will decide to do otherwise, uh, such as the famous Black Sam Bellampy in uh, Calico Jack Rackham. They will go ahead and say, well, we're going to just start attacking English vessels as well. Even though we were privateers and we were trying to be legitimate privateers on, under most cases, um, nevertheless, they decide eventually it would be in their interest um, because pirate crews vote for their captain. And in order to remain captain of the ship, you have to be successful. If you are not successful, of course, then you are voted out of your captaincy. This happens to Benjamin Hornigold, and they just actually, he gets to keep his, his own ship, uh, but uh, he was commodore of a pirate fleet, right, where you control uh, more than one ship. You then move from captain to commodore, and, uh, but uh, Hornigold was decided because he refused to allow them to attack uh, English ships, especially rich slaving vessels. And this is a, this is a strike, I think, against um, the sort of notion that these pirate, these, these pirate havens were republican, egalitarian in any grand sense of the term, because they were quite eager to attack um, English slave vessels, these vessels that are bringing over slave uh, from, from Africa. Um, and they were they would take the cargoes of slaves, and in some cases, as as we will see, uh, they would offer the slaves their freedom. But in other cases, uh, uh, they would they would take the slaves and sell them at market for the, as much money as they could get for them. So they were uh, maybe not the most egalitarian, but uh, sometimes they would be more uh, they would be more fair and democratic than would a royal naval vessel or the merchant marine, which treated a captain as like. He were a quasi king, um, but these are just some of the kind of famous names that are involved with uh, with piracy and, and buccaneering um, in the 
in the Caribbean at this time, and as I've, I've mentioned, Benjamin Hornigold, and Edward Thatch, who is you will probably know better by the name of Blackbeard, was sort of a lieutenant of, of Benjamin Hornigold, and he stays with him after he loses his, uh, his Commodore ship, and eventually Hornigold will come to, to control another fleet of privateers, and uh, he's going to give Thatch his own ship, which will become the Queen Anne's Revenge, uh, and, uh, and then Thatch will invent this sort of image of himself as Blackbeard, that he would, he would put uh, cannon fuse in his beard and he would light it up and he would attack ships and just be this kind of insane man. And he always had his dutiful, uh, dutiful and dearest friend, uh, uh, Caesar, that would go with him. And he's, uh, he was uh, an escaped slave, and so therefore many would refer to him as Black Caesar. Um, these are the kind of legend figures that would, uh, would come out of, um, out of this period of golden age of, of piracy. Now, I referred to Sam Bellamy, Black Sam Bellamy, who, um, he was a legitimate artisan in, in, a, um, in New England. And eventually, he, he, uh, he falls in love with a woman, and he doesn't have enough money, and her family doesn't like him because he's uh, dirt poor. So he goes out, and he, he, or he sets out to, to make some money, and he actually ends up uh, dying uh, though he died in, in the wreck of a, of a storm uh, in his piracy career, he becomes one of the richest uh, pirates uh, ever. But he doesn't actually start out to be a pirate. He just wants to go down and make enough money that he can sort of marry the, uh, the girl of his dreams. He never makes it back. He never sees her again after, after he leaves uh, New England. Uh, but uh, on his, the conquest of this, uh, this very large and new state-of-the-art slave ship, the, uh, the Widowa, um, he makes this famous speech, and it's, it's quoted in, uh, uh, in Captain Johnson's book on piracy from 1724 uh, that I, I had mentioned. And Bellamy is making a speech to the captain of, of the ship, uh, one whose name, a man's name, I believe, is Beer. And this is, this is one of the, the documents that is used to say, well, these pirate groups were about egalitarians, that they gave everyone a fair shot, that they were, uh, they were democratic to a great degree. So I'll relate to you the words of Sam Bellamy, recorded there on, that, on this day. And this is a slave ship, keep in mind. He's giving this speech before a group of slaves that they have taken out of the hold of the ship that have come from Africa, who have been mistreated, who are, uh, who, who are standing before their captors and may yet uh, give justice to them. And I must say also that how did they take the this vastly larger ship than their own small sloop? Uh, well, they, uh, they play on their legends as being these, these awful pirates of the Caribbean, and they, they take off their clothes, and they literally attack the ship stark naked. Uh, and they, they are just madmen. So the, the ship surrenders. The captain's ship surrenders because he's terrified of what might happen. And it is a grand chase, and it's a, it's a wonderful story uh, how they, uh, they capture the widow. And it, is, uh, it takes three days for them to finally catch them. And as I say, then they strip down in the night, and they, and they come aboard uh, just dressed like, uh, you know, carrying torches and, and like madmen that finally the captain just gives up without firing a shot. And then later in the day, Bellamy makes this speech uh, before all of the the, uh, the merchant marine crew who often hated their captains because their captains mistreated them so badly they didn't, they didn't pay them, and obviously there's another group of slaves. So this is the words of Sam Bellamy. I am sorry they won't let you have your sloop again, speaking to the captain, because he's been mutinied against. The crew has come over to Bellamy. For I scorn to do anyone a mischief when it is not to my advantage. Damn the sloop, we must sink her, and she might be of use to you. Though you are a sneaking puppy, and so are all of those you will submit to be governed by laws which rich men have made for their own security. For the cowardly whelps have not the courage otherwise to defend what they get by knavery. But damn ye all together, damn them for a pack of crafty rascals, and you who serve them for a parcel of hen-hearted numbskulls. They vilify us, the scoundrels do, when there is only this difference. They rob the poor under the cover of law. 
forsooth, and we plunder the rich under the protection of our own courage. Had you not better make them than one of, of, of us than sneak after these villains for employment? You are a devilish conscience rascal. I am a free prince, and I have as much authority to make war on the whole world as he who has a hundred sail of ships at sea and an army of a hundred thousand men in the field. And this is what my conscience tells me. But there is no arguing with such sniveling puppies who allow their superiors to kick them about a deck at their pleasure. So the words of Black Sam here, telling us that he is Robin Hood and he is not a thief at sea, but he is giving justice uh, to those who have been long under the boot of the tyrant. So uh, there's some thought on this, but uh, at the end of the day, these, uh, these people are still can, kind of considered pirates, um, but there is, this is what gives the nostalgia about this group of people. Um, these, uh, um, these, these people are more, larger than pirates, that they are playing into this enlightenment sense of, of equality um, and that, uh, that you have certain rights and that you don't have to serve uh, monarchs and rich aristocrats and, and captains at seas, but be your own man. Give, uh, take what is your fair share kind of, kind of argument. So uh, rousing stuff here from Sam Bellamy. And I just draw your attention that uh, not only were men able to become pirates, but also uh, people like Anne Bonny, who's an Irish lass who comes down and she, uh, she shacks up for a while with, uh, with Benjamin Hornigold uh, in, in their base in Nassau. And then eventually she becomes uh, a girlfriend of Edward Thatch, uh, also known as Blackbeard. And Blackbeard was very famous. He, I think he had seven or eight wives, at least, that we know of. Uh, one in each port of call that he, he had. But uh, eventually, Anne Bonny has her own ship. Uh, she and Calico Jack Rackham, uh, uh, they are kind of a raiding uh, couple together. And so she's eventually caught. Um, but she's, she is able to exercise, basically, many of, of the roles and have many of the uh, luxuries of being a man and from her base out of Nassau and living among these, these, uh, these pirates. So it, it, in, in a way, it is more egalitarian, I suppose, for, for a woman. And, but, uh, of course, they, she is eventually caught, and the only way she escapes the hangman's noose is by uh, you know, pleading, the, pleading her belly, they're saying she was, she was pregnant. And... Uh, uh, let us just take a moment here and kind of examine the, the sailing ships of the day. So the, the pirate ship is typically not one that was a, a ship of the line here, a, a massive three-decked uh, ship where, with uh, guns, well-trained uh, sailors, you know, but you're, you're looking much more at something like the sloop, a small vessel here um, that was able to, to go into shallow waters and avoid avoid capture by being able to be a, a, a smaller sneakier to be to hide in many ways though as time would go on and and that the, really the height of of uh, the time at the port of Nassau pirates were able to have very large ships um, of course the widow it was a more than a 28 gun ship so I mean you, almost at the the level of the frigate there is where um, uh, Black Sam had a, had a very large ship, and they would not just have one, but of course they'd have several sloops with them, and anything that they could capture. Because most of the time, especially uh, if you uh, get uh, get boarded by a pirate like Black Sam Bellamy, uh, they're not going to kill you, they're not going to mistreat you, um, but they're going to take some some of your goods and leave you your ship. But in some cases, they will actually take your ship too. Um, if you get boarded uh, someone, by someone like Charles Vane, who was uh, a madman and a psychopath, uh, then he might uh, do anything he wanted, torture you, kill you, uh, do anything. So some pir pirates, of course, have their own reputations, and, and uh, they, are, uh, they, did, they did create these things called pirate codes that were sort of uh, general guidelines uh, more than actual laws, um, but... But there were certain codes that everyone got an equal share of the plunder. The captain got a bit more, uh, but not massively more like in the Merchant Marine or in the Royal Navy. Rather, it was much more uh, egalitarian. 
But if a captain was not un was was unsuccessful, then you voted the captain off and someone else took over. If a captain mistreated one of the crew, then the captain could be voted out. A vote of confidence could be held, and then the captain could suffer just you know be be uh, justice could be done. So uh, it was slightly more democratic, but uh, I I find it uh, not a necessarily an egalitarian uh, type of of existence for these people. And each pirate vessel, each captain, would have his own flag. Here you can see uh, the Jolly Roger, but here is Blackbeard's uh, flag, the one that flew over the Queen Anne's Revenge. And uh, so therefore you could know, and, and these were famous around the Caribbean, uh, that if you saw this particular flag, you knew what you were about to encounter. And actually Blackbeard doesn't hardly kill anyone. Uh, he, he rarely kills or mistreats anyone. Uh, actually, he just takes your cargo and lets you carry on about your day. As I said, choose your pirate wisely um, because uh, they can be fairly honorable or they can be, you know, psychopath like Charles Vane. So here we have the Spanish Empire. And we have the Spanish Empire at the end of the age of piracy. What brings an end to this golden age of piracy? Well, it was uh, the getting involved uh, uh, in the business of colonization by the English and the French and the Dutch. So uh, privateers still did exist, but as time goes on during the 17th century, uh, the notion of sending out a bunch of sea dogs like Sir Francis Drake or uh, Sir Henry Morgan to go out and plunder the Spanish is just not going to be tolerated anymore, that there's been a change in policy, that the English, the Dutch, the, and the French now really want to begin establishing colonies instead of of just raiding spanish shipping because that is of course the goal of privateering is to seize large uh, uh captures of of uh, uh of precious metals from the spanish and it's actually discovered that you can sell things from the new world instead of just using it as a sort of place where you can exploit it for its uh, for its bullion wealth uh, for its precious metals uh, rather that the English, uh, especially the English, began to establish colonies and sugar plantations, and then you uh, you import slaves because the Native Americans are not uh, the, uh, they don't uh, hold up well, and there becomes a readily uh, available source of labor uh, that that uh, they could exploit. As remember, their voyages are continuing to go around the Horn of Africa and along the coast of Africa. So relationships are beginning to be established uh, with African kings and chieftains there. And these Africans fight in wars against other African tribes, and they seize the, uh, uh, the people that they have, have uh, won battles over, and they sell them into slavery. And Europeans are all too happy uh, in order to, to buy them and take them to their sugar plantations. As the climates that uh, these Africans come out of, they're far better suited for working in the tropical conditions of the of the uh, of the Caribbean uh, than were the Native Americans, uh, and that they they just tend to survive longer. And uh, the, as horrific as this is, this becomes uh, a uh, the the main source, the most lucrative source of wealth is to uh, is uh, slave importation as well as uh, the sugar trade, and then also you will have later the tobacco trade and these kinds of things as well, uh, but. In the Caribbean, at least, and, and the, the former Spanish colonies, it is sugar um, and the slave trade that is, is, uh, is enormous. And the Spanish don't really get involved with this. They are, they're just interested in exploitation and not so much, um, not nearly so much as, as, uh, as setting up colonial, uh, a colonial uh, economic system like the English or the Dutch were. And moreover, what did Spain do with this vast amount of wealth that came into its, uh, into its, its, its European uh, uh, center? Well, it just spent it all. It did not invest in any kind of national infrastructure. It did not build up its own uh, great reserves that might have served it well over time, but it simply uh, it, it just spent all the wealth on, on a, a lavish, lavish things, building palaces, uh, uh, buying luxury goods from the Far East. Um, it, was, it was all gone, and, they, and Spain uh, had not that much to show for it at the end of of the uh, of the 17th century and this really becomes the time where 
when uh, when England and, and, and the Dutch become the economic colossuses of the world instead of Spain. Spain really has its, its day from, uh, you know, 1520 to uh, 1530 to, you know, around seven, 1700 or, or a little thereafter. Um, but because they chose not to enter into a, a well thought out economic plan in the world and, and instead move towards uh, economic exploitation, whereas the English Dutch choose different routes. Well, because they had to, because they didn't have the, the same luxury of having a vastly wealthy in gold and silver colonies. Instead, they turn to, to the creation of empires. And they then design protective acts, such as the Navigation Acts in, in England, to, that keeps everything within the English imperial system. And they found companies in order to share the burden of, of risk on slave importation uh, um, voyages. Uh, they, these companies, these joint stock companies, will then come to uh, share the burden of risk on settlements in various places, such as Jamestown. Um, and in this, they are far more successful in the long term than were the Spanish. So... I thank you for watching this lecture, and I hope that we have come to see how the Spanish invasion and eventually the conquest of the New World transformed everything in world economics uh, and, it, uh, and how its failure to establish um, a, a well-rooted, cash-cropped colonial system like that of uh, the Netherlands uh, as well as England, uh, led to its its ultimate decline, and how the role of of pirates is is played within this grand uh, century that is the 1600s, and how the, these legendary figures like Blackbeard um, have come down to our own time that we make films about them now, and that it was a sense of this is this sense of egalitarianism, of freedom, of lo this legacy of liberty that comes down to us even through pirates or buccaneers in, in, the ancient, or in, in, uh, in this early modern world um, that, uh, that leads us to this sense of nostalgia that we have for them uh, even now. So thank you very much for watching.